we've got Claire, Liz and DJ, Ollie and Tracy, and we've got apologies. Oh, and Steve, is your camera on, Steve? And then we've got apologies from AJ who had to get called away, so um, we will not be having him today. Hi, Steve. Hi okay. there, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. So I'm just going to randomly pick on you all, I'm afraid, and let you set your scene and I will go and get your YouTube or Vimeo link as required. So Cara, hopefully is here as well, somewhere in the background. So with that, I will pick on you, Claire, to start. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Claire Timmons. I'm from the University of Strathclyde. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to make teaching um, as enjoyable as, well, I would find it, um, and then also for the students. And um, I, I was at the session last year and there was lots of amazing ideas around escape rooms and I really wanted to try it out, but I hadn't quite got the place yet. Some of the teaching I do really works well for it. So my session was talking about how I created a, an escape room, but as a, an assessment. So it was at the end of a semester of teaching, which is fairly fact based descriptive stuff. It's about how you speak um, and all the parts that are involved in that. And it was quite a nice journey. So I created an online escape room through OneNote, um, created a little character and whose journey it was that went through. Um, and it went really well. It was really enjoyable to create. I got some great ideas from presenters from last year. Um, but one of the bits that I found challenging was then how to assess, how to have this as an assessment, which actually felt that they, I was assessing the student's ability. I think the tasks, they did need to know the stuff in order to be able to do it, but um, I kind of said they could all pass it. So there wasn't really, you know, it was very, very low stakes. Um, and it was a colleague afterwards going, well, if, you, if they know they can't fail it, then is anyone going to revise? And a big thing for me was saying, well, I want you to do the work to learn it, to be able to do the assessment on the day. Um, and that was the learning then, and they would eventually do the, the journey of the escape room. So I kind of got a bit stuck at that point and thinking about, well, what would I do? And I've actually got some ideas already from today, but um, I kind of opened that up in the uh, recording to see if um, there was anyone that would like to help me <laughs> with that question <laughs> with all this great experience that we've got here so yeah it was a, a phonetic journey of an air particle from the lungs all the way through to the atmospheric air and all the different steps that they take and the students had to work on different riddles that were connected to the teaching content so they couldn't just do it by being good at like riddles or puzzles they had to know the content in order to be able to yeah get to the end of that particular game or puzzle to move on through so that's me thank you so i think we'll we'll go around everybody and then we'll come back to kind of those prompts and questions so that's a really good start claire you you've thrown the gauntlet to the audience rather than the audience Get it to you. So well done. Clever. <laughs> Keep going, everyone. You just we'll stick on that track. <laughs> OK, Steve, would you like to go next? Thank you, Claire. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, and, and thanks so much for, for inviting me along to uh, well to post my YouTube video, of course, and also along to today's session. Um, so, um, yes, I'm Steve Phillips. I'm a chief marketing officer of a company called Escapism Learning. Um, we've been going for about um, four years or so now. Uh, we it's, uh, it's a startup, small startup, um, but essentially the the operation has been born out of uh, lived experience of uh, working in the corporate environment where learning is literally so far down the ladder it's it's unreal um yeah a lot of people have to do mandatory training which uh, which is like paying taxes for most people frankly it's usually left until deadline day guessing the answers or or indeed maybe um getting the accessible pdf and searching the answers is another good way of cheating but uh, ultimately people don't retain the information and so essentially what we've been doing uh, for the last few years or so is to create as much fun as possible around any given subject no matter how dry it perceptively is um we don't use um 
Our sort of our main MO and my background is in cyber security for the last few years. So it's been cyber escape rooms. Um, but we've banished uh, things like the hoodie um, because that's generally the go to image when everyone, everyone ever does a cyber security presentation, hoodie, basement, matrix and so on. So um, so we tend to use as many fun elements as possible, try to make it as engaging and warm and actually to really give people reassurance, because in the corporate world, you really have to report anything suspicious. Um, and also do that in your personal lives as well. But you really do have to report anything suspicious. So if you think you've clicked on a phishing link, a lot of people uh, don't feel empowered. They feel a little bit, I'm going to get in trouble. And so that's why we sort of take the narrative approach that we've taken. But we also realise working in the commercial sector that customization is key as well. Try and get the experience to look like it's coming from the company and not from us building it for them because hopefully these little one percent things like having uh, you know a, um, a chief information security officer at that company playing the role of the hacker in one of our videos for example is much better than using one of our actors because you just get that that little bit more connection and anything that generates adrenaline uh, countdown clocks and all the rest of it is all to the good because i can tell you some hilarious anecdotes of people getting overexcited falling out over hugging you know all the things um which uh, which has, has made it for a memorable experience and the idea is that becomes a vessel for the core message to sort of sit in and get into people's heads for a lot longer so that's in a nutshell uh indeed a nutshell that's the nub in a nutshell of what we do <laughs> Excellent, Steve. And I'm sure all of us in the room can have a lot of overlap with many of your um, painful parts there. So, yes, <laughs> cybersecurity, big issue, engagement, super big issue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're the new plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> You'll always Excellent. need us. <laughs> Tracy, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Webb. So I'm the learning technology team manager at Bournemouth University. Um, and I work with Ollie Moore, who's also here. So I'll I'll say something, Ollie, and then I'll pass to you to maybe talk about some of the other bits. Um, so we um, talked about a escape room that we did. We actually did a in classroom in a sort of physical environment um, last summer. Um, the driver for it was we had bought a lot of equipment sort of um, for technical innovation to use with our staff and our teaching staff. And then we all, it was literally just before COVID, we all went into lockdown. And then we came back and we were like, right, we need to get people using this equipment. We wanted to get interest back with the tools and things. So we decided we'd do the skate room because we thought that would be really fun. Um, and we have a conference that we run every year. So we used one of the sessions at the conference to run this escape room. So what we were really doing was showing some of the tech we had. So each element of the room was using a different piece of tech. So, for example, you had to use we set up a 360 camera like as a sort of CCTV. Um, you had to go into a VR headset to find um, a pass on Google Maps, which was also getting a code. Um, we had a piece of software called Cooler, which is a 360 sort of walkthrough software. And we took a photo of the room. We put little clues in cupboards and things. So the people sort of explored the room virtually. Um, so, yeah, so it was um, really, really fun to do um, and really fun on the day when we did it as well. Um, I, what else can I say? I'll pass to you or you can perhaps talk a bit about the narrative that we put behind it. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think as a something that was very much a focus of Steve's uh, talk is about how storytelling can be so effective in the immersion and discovery of um, of, of new content, new learning. So um, I think for me, it, it, it goes it goes just a little bit further in the sense that I, I also find it's useful for making elements of the story make sense in terms of how someone's thinking about um, I guess it, that's kind of part and parcel with the immersion aspect. But um, yeah, we wanted because we were using all this technology and there was so much conversation around ChatGPT. And one of the other softwares that Tracy didn't mention was that we also you were using the AI avatars. We we're just trying those out um, uh, to see what 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 sort of the response would be to those. Um, so it was a, we wanted to frame it around like technology and 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 a lot of the topics mostly to create engagement, relatability and and um, 
and also yeah because of the, the the focus of of our thing being the exposition of these different technologies um it made sense to to build a narrative around that technology um but m i think one of the things you're always worried about with escape rooms is not wanting them to always to go to waste especially if they're a physical one um so we actually even though we had built ours um with this we, we built ours with a linear uh sort of storyline mostly because we weren't expecting a huge number of people we wanted and because of the the requirement for technology and the limits of, on the number of pieces of equipment that we had we wanted to stagger how people were engaging with that technology so if a couple of people came in they'd start using it and then maybe 15 minutes later someone else might come in and then you know the vr headset's not being used so it was it was helpful to promote that um aspect of um you know staggered entry in, into the puzzles but we ended up having so many people come at once that kind of all happened at the same time anyway um but yeah we designed it to be um linear because after the actual the the after the live escape room we wanted it to be a asynchronous escape room you know so that it wouldn't all you know we could show them that they could make this stuff um on on the vle for themselves asynchronously as well um and also to kind of show that escape rooms aren't necessarily a group activity it's great to have them as a group activity but you can build them um, for individuals as well. Um, so hopefully showing a lot of different things um, uh, was was the goal, you know, what you can do with technology, what you can do with escape rooms and just, as you say, reinvigorate that interest in, um, in, in different styles of teaching. I'm seeing a sea of nodding heads, Ollie. <laughs> we all really related to that one. Um, so thank you for that. Now, Cara, have we got you back OK? And if not, Emma, are you here? Hi, Becca. Hi. Are we the last people to talk? No. We also have DJ and Liz. Oh, dropping out. DJ and Liz, do you want to go next then while Kyra comes back? Uh, hi there, yeah, I'm DJ McIntyre. I'm the Gaelic language officer for the University of Islands Islands up here in Inverness. Um, and I'm just here to support my colleague Liz. I don't know if she's in the call at the moment because she was mobile coming back from an appointment. So um, uh, hopefully she'll she'll be here. But if not, I'll give you a brief outline on. Hello, Claire. Can you see us and hear us? Fantastic. Perfect timing, Liz. So Cara, Liz and DJ are just going to go first because we thought you lost. We lost you, okay? That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, as part of my responsibilities, we do have a Gaelic language plan at the university, and part of that plan, I introduced a Gaelic awareness and support project a number of years ago. Now, the project, although as exciting as it was, it was really based on the normal kind of language learning services and facilities we had. In other words, either doing some learning on live, uh, live on um, on the internet or doing stuff in class or uh, on occasion uh, by phone, which is just really how it shows you how dated it was. So having discussed with Liz a way forward um, during the project, Liz came up with the um, idea of having Gaelic escape rooms so we run with that because at the moment there isn't really anything to match that out there and like i mentioned the traditional way of learning is popular but i think we need these days with gaelic now being uh, used through duolingo by uh, thousands of people i think it was time to introduce something new that would make it more exciting um and what it means is through the escape rooms we can now introduce um, an exciting challenge while you're learning a language and also revitalize some of the old words, some of the old maps, some of the old sayings and also some of the old challenges they had years ago that maybe now have been um, forgotten about. So it's fine learning a language and learning about colors and family 
and the weather. Uh, however, when you're also having to use a bit of brain power to work out um, puzzles and clues and stuff through the escape room, it just makes it all the more challenging, but also all the more enjoyable. And we have trialled this through um, some of our staff, um, and they really found it um, um, not just exciting, but also a, a real way ahead to improve their language skills and also the way they actually motivate themselves in, in learning um, Gaelic. Um, so it's just a non-traditional way of learning, but a really exciting one. And through um, the escape room, we've managed now to attract interest from other learning groups. Of course, at the University in the Hankson Islands, we do have the college, the Gaelic College in Sky, Salmore Ostic, and also we have uh, degrees and other courses through our Northwest and Highland, um, Northwestern Hebrides, sorry, college. So this is something we perhaps can introduce more, not just to staff, but also to students and also to some of our alumni. Um, so it's been really, really profitable for me because um, having introduced a new Gaelic language plan, this is something new that's really attractive to my learners and they're really enjoying the, the learning trip now. So I'll hand over to Liz just to, and um, she's the expert on this, I just provide the, the Gaelic for her. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm back indoors now. <laughs> Right, so yeah, um, I, I suppose, I don't know where to pick up from, so I'm, I'm Liz Hudson and I'm the uh, Director of Learning at Lexedio. Now I used to work at UHR, I was there for four and a half years and DJ was, we, we started this project while I was still employed there and my colleague um, Elaine as well, she's now uh, joined me. Um, and I set it up partially to kind of train other people in learning design, um, but also because I really wanted to um, explore beyond the the kind of traditional forms of, of online learning blended, all the boxes that we put learning into, and especially that kind of online offline dichotomy, if you like. So there's that aspect. And also I'm quite interested in kind of creating custom pedagogies for every project that we work on. And the Gallic project was a really, you know, the more and more we kind of explored the cultural themes and, and language learning strategies and things like that, it, it struck me that, you know, a lot of the, the, the learning theories that are associated with teaching modern languages, well, they're, they're designed for just that. They're very, they're aimed at teaching kind of Western ways of learning. And there's a lot to be gained from that. We definitely kind of use some of that to inform, you know, our approach. But we also looked at kind of, well, how, if we were to go back 100, 200, 300 years, how was knowledge shared, you know, within, um, you know, Gallic communities? And, and I was finding kind of, my research was taking me down various different sort of rabbit holes and looking at indigenous cultures around the world who all have their own pedagogical traditions and we found that there was quite a lot in in Gallic uh, communities that's quite common with with other communities the other side of the world completely different traditions but there was storytelling which I know has, has been brought up by by Ollie and, and um, other people here today in other sessions as well that's one of those key themes the connection to landscape and myths and uh, nature and all those different things are so kind of exciting and interesting. And then you've got some of the traditions that, you know, are so unique, like the Oum runes, which can be found kind of engraved onto stones uh, around kind of like the Celtic areas across the UK. And it's just a treat, really, if you're designing an escape room, you've got kind of codes and things that are already there and they're, they're authentic to the actual culture. So it's just really exciting. And we didn't try to kind of, um, you know, stick to kind of this model or that pedagogical model, but just sort of try things out. And it was really exciting when we were trying out some of the in-person activities, just listening to the buzz and the conversation that was going on around the activities. And that was where the learning was taking place. Quite often not the the learning outcomes that we'd, we'd actually kind of got on paper as well. It, there were, there were collateral learning, as I think I mentioned in, in my video. And so we, we looked at that as an in-person thing. We've we've got a kind of a virtual sort of a hybrid versions and a Teams-based kind of um, concepts that we've looked at as well. But the latest one is the completely online version, because it was like, well, 
what if we didn't have the room and the stuff and the wooden board and all all that what if we had you know if you were on your own what could we create that's still kind of immersive um with a limited budget and time scales um my background is originally kind of e-learning development so i've worked with tools like storyline and captivate um, and I thought, I think I bet I could create an interactive escape room in using those tools. Um, so that's there's, there's a link to the kind of pre-launch version, which I think there's a link. Thank you so much, Claire, for putting it on at the last moment. Um, it's been added because it's not quite ready on the, the main UHO website. Uh, they're really busy. Um, but there's a link to, to the game and, and activities. Um, so, yeah, we created that in there. And it, it's, it's got some inspirations of the different kind of um, myths and culture and things like that but there's so much potential to tie into modern themes you know hacking could be linked into cyber we've got kind of a there's the good society and there's the bad society and they're, they're always hacking the good society so there's definitely you know potential to kind of mo have modern themes you know juxtaposed with like the ancient traditions um, but yeah that's me rambling on a little bit <laughs> I'm all energized from all that walking in the fresh air <laughs> The active theme is the day as well. Perfect, Liz. And um, perfectly, it's going to the next set of speakers because we're following on with the language and keeping that theme going. And we're keeping the theme going where we have two um, links, not just one. So I will put the links in in the background, Cara, and you can explain the, the difference between the two videos. Okie dokes. Can you hear me OK, Claire? Right. Um, as you can see, we are here today in our immersive room uh, and I'll let Glyn talk to you a little bit about that in a second. Um, we are at the beginning of our escape room journey, so we've really enjoyed the experience of the event today and have learned a great deal. And as you said, Claire, there's a lot of parallels between what we're doing and the previous presenters. Um, so. My journey with escape rooms started actually very low tech um, with PowerPoint uh, during lockdown. Um, I teach Welsh language um, and Welsh language teaching methodology here at the university to trainee teachers and teachers who are taken out of school for a two month two term secondment. So we we sort of teach Welsh language, Welsh culture, as well as Welsh language teaching methodologies. So my first example was very, very simple, using animations in PowerPoint uh, to teach maths through the medium of Welsh, a very simple level primary school teachers. Um, that then developed this idea of creating an escape room to teach language into a cultural um, escape room in this immersive room here. And I've worked with Emma, who I'll hand over to in a second to create an, a cultural experience. The Youth Eisteddfod of Wales is a Welsh medium event that happens every year, different locations, and thousands of children go to the event. But not every child in Wales is aware of the event. Welsh is only spoken by a fairly small percentage of uh, the population. Um, so we wanted to sort of bring that experience to those children that didn't perhaps have any idea, any concept of the Eisteddfod. So we've just changed here to be in the Eisteddfod to give them a taste of what it's like, what it, the excitement and the sound. One competition that's quite accessible, whether you can speak Welsh or not, is the Cogir um, competition. If anyone's actually seen the presentation already, it does seem a bit bizarre. You can see in the background somewhere we've got pictures of carrots and onions, um, but it's creating a very simple recipe, uh, often with a Welsh flair, um, and then they get to compete at the ice step the board. So I worked with Emma uh, to create something that, I'll let Emma talk about it a little bit more perhaps, but that introduces the ice step the board. There is a language element, really exciting. We talk about noun, gender and counting in Welsh. Um, but I think just being in this room, when we talk about language planning, we often talk about language prestige and the previous speakers talked about this a little bit. 
that we're going back centuries of culture, but we want it to be contemporary and that it's something that excites and ignites the interest of a new generation, perhaps that feel a bit disconnected to their past. So that's why we've created this. My other project um, is a science based escape room and it was originally just supposed to be a plenary session after doing the language patterns in the normal classroom. But teaching teachers is quite an experience in itself and they just ran with it and it became a competition. And it developed into a. An escape room essentially, and we've done two different iterations of it and the second one had the timer, the music, the looking for a code and the theme, the narrative was to free the frogs because we don't test on frogs in our lab um, and they had to do a number of different challenges, all language based, practicing the language patterns that they'd already learned. Um, and then they would get a code at the end of the iPad that. Um, how do I put it? And AR frogs were then released via the iPad. Lots of fun um, and really engaging. The, the feedback, um, very, very positive. With language learning, one of the big things, as anybody knows who's learned a language, is getting that confidence and not worrying about making mistakes. And that's what we found in, in the room here, that people forget completely about making mistakes. They just want to win um, and they just have a go and they use the patterns. Um, yeah, so language acquisition, really successful. And um, can I pass over to you to talk a little bit about our uh, Eisteddfod Cogir room? Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. My name is Emma Jones, digital learning technologist at the University of Wales, Trinity and David. Um, working with Cara and the digital experience and engagement team, as you can see on screen there in the immersive room. So just very briefly, part of my role was to look at bridging the gap between Cara's original online idea and how we can bring it into the immersive room, but using platforms that are accessible for staff something that staff can build from the comfort of their desktops, bring into the room and run with it themselves. That then leads them on to develop further um, sort of ideas that they can work with the digital experience team on to have something a bit more high tech um, and resource intensive, like some of the examples that that Glyn and Nathan and Callum have have created with the crime scene one. So, Another part of, of my role there is um, the immersive room is is a 360. Um, well, not quite the 360, we don't have a back wall, but it's it's to replicate that VR um, environment, but having that collaborative element to it. So rather than being standalone at your PC doing an escape room, it's you can bring people in the room together, that sense of collaborative uh, collaboration. And on top of that, getting students to work together. So the idea of the Estevo then was to bring that authentic experience to those students so that they can experience the Welsh Language Festival for themselves um, and something that they can translate to then teaching their pupils when they go back to school. So it was keen on getting some sort of interactivity into the room there. So Google Slides has lent itself very well um, because you can manipulate the size of the canvas. And as you can see, the, the, the images have come out quite crisp. So that's very brief for me, bridging the gap between um, Cara's original idea, bringing it to the life into the immersive room that then lends itself to working closer with the digital experience and engagement team. Thank you. It was something that I could create myself using Google Slides and I used Canva to create the images. So accessible to most academics across across campus. And that's what we, would, we were aiming for. So from something quite simple, um, I'm going to hand over to Glyn and um, to talk about the uh, crime scene escape room. Yeah, so hi guys, my name is Glyn. I am the Digital Experience and Engagement Manager here at UWTSD. And obviously we're sitting in the immersive room here on our Swansea campus and I suppose we've stumbled a little bit into escape rooms outside of Cara's interest in developing that low tech solution, um, something which she can obviously do independently as a lecturer. So that's what we, we like to see, encouragement and, and people being able to utilise the room themselves. However, we did get approached by the widening access department who are going to host some sessions surrounding 
uh, law and public service. Got that right, I was struggling to remember. And Nathan, in fairness, who's our VR technologist, this one, um, it came up with the idea. We, we've been working on uh, another VR project with South Wales Police, and we the idea sort of flowed on from that, where we thought, well, it's law and public service. Um, Brighton Access gave us a little bit of a brief. Uh, I can't remember what the brief is, but Nathan probably will. But um, so we, we we could reuse some assets, and we already had some stuff there. And we thought, well, we haven't actually tried doing something big in the immersive room. So I suppose you came up with it, Nathan came up with the concept, started uh, skate scoping that out, and then we as a team sort of came on board looking at tasks and the puzzles and how could the you know that work. And I suppose it just grew then from a collaborative effort. And we've got this digital display, as you can see, which we've recreated a, a child's bedroom. So the whole concept surrounds a missing persons. So the aim is it, make, uh, it, it sort of coincides with the idea of searching, which lends itself to an escape room, piecing clues together. Do they attach? Are they linked together or are they just separate individual clues? So that's something obviously people have to work out. So this sort of developed over time digitally and we also introduced physical assets into the room as well. So we put um, props around, we've got bean bags for the room, uh, floor pillows and so on. So we tried, we, we, we added that physical aspect into the room as well. So there's a mixture of digital and physical assets, um, which you know we, we think has, has worked quite well. But upon testing, one of the big things we've learned as a team that look after and support you, the utilisation of this room is how an escape room actually highlights the difference in the way people think and approach things. Now, obviously, from a room like this, experiential learning is a key part of, of teaching and learning. And from us to develop uh, content and assist Cara and other lecturers with developing the content, whether that's um, a more skilled area or just assisting them with something low tech, we we. It was the escape room actually provided a really big sort of ma magnifying glass then, like I say, into how people think and, and sort of approach problems. So we've had a number of groups in to help us test whether the difficulties there, whether it was too easy, too hard. Do people focus too much on the digital, not on the physical? Or do people focus on the physical, not on the digital and vice versa and so on? So it was one of those things where we really picked up on different departments think differently and is that a trait potentially of that demographic or that department or the, the way they work whereas we tested it on other colleagues uh, amongst our team and this team included and they approached it completely differently to other people so it's really interesting to see the different minds and how people attack problems so from I think we're near completion in fairness to, to the escape room um, it's an interesting thing moving forward and uh, I think we are Looking forward to seeing where this goes within the university. And I'm really looking forward on a, a selfish level how we can use this um, to teach language. And uh, haven't quite thought that one through yet, but that's where we're at. So yeah, do you about? Thank you all so much. So I was spotlighting that fabulous room for people. So hopefully that will come through really well on the recording. It is so incredible how all of the talks are so different, but how many common elements are really going through each one. So the kind of the basic tech to the high tech, the taking of topics that people don't generally engage with to make them engaging the language the kind of the drawing back on culture and i think that's something that's come across uh, across the day is that despite the digital and ai and all the things that we kind of are on our landscape turning back is something that a lot of people have been talking about across the day and kind of reconnecting with things that or tactile or historical or cultural. So that's really, really lovely um, to see in each. So I don't want to hog the questions. So we've got a couple so far that are practical for people around the money. So I think that's probably for both sets who had the kind of more um, physical equipment. So the rooms, the VR, so if we have, I'll just let you jump in then to, to answer that one and then drop in questions as we go. Would 
but is, was that a question for us, Claire? I think it was probably yourselves, Cara, but I don't know if Ollie and Tracy then want to come in for as well on their tools too. So if we go first, Cara, and then Tracy and Ollie. Can you read the question out for me, Claire? So cost of the actual room and the tech then within it, I think. So it's two separate questions on the same topic. Uh, yeah, so Callum, my colleague sitting to the other side of me, has just sort of helped answer that. So we have two of these actual rooms. Uh, we've got one here on our Swansea campus. We've got another one on our Carmarthen campus, which are identical in nature. Slightly, slightly different screen size, but the entire same functionality. So what we can do in Carmarthen, uh, Swansea, we can do in Carmarthen as well. So the two rooms themselves cost around 1. Point, what do you say? 1.2, which is about right. Yeah, 1.2 million. Um, so this is above my, you know, above my, uh, <laughs> above my, uh, what should I say, position. I, I had no, no say in that, but I think we had some funds and so on. So that was both rooms. What they are, instead of most rooms like this are potentially VR, uh, VR, uh, projector based, which can bring the cost down. However, I was at LED panels, which is why we are getting that vibrant, clear picture in the background. So they're not getting washed out too much by the cameras and so on. So that in itself is a bit more costly. We also have a 7.1 surround sound system. So obviously we can add that immersive sound to the room as well. Um, we have that high powered workstation, which is enabled to run a lot of the software that we see behind us. So the room itself is compatible with a number of different th uh, software which we uh, utilize across the university as well. So obviously Google Slides, YouTube 360, which is really handy for the screens. Anything else? Google Earth, uh, Google Street View, which is really handy as well. Like Miro. Miro, yeah, the Miro goes with really well. Right. Mantaport, the scanning, I'm glad my team are used to remind me now. Revisto. Yeah, Revisto as well, which is an architect, a piece of software. So these are all softwares that we use within the uni, which is very handy, because they are compatible with the room. But also from a, uh, an application perspective, Unreal Engine and Unity, the sort of game development applications are also highly compatible with the room. So the escape room itself is actually created in Unreal and we can load it up and we use a software called Igloo, which helps us wrap around the rooms. So they configure the rooms really nicely. So yeah, this, this in fairness, we're, we're very fortunate with a good infrastructure at the moment. Um, everything sort of, I think as, as good as it can be at the moment um, and it's just us then trying to utilize that the best we can and exploit different functions and seeing how far we can push the technology at, at present. Um, from that perspective saying that with the content, the custom content, we as a team um, assist with that. So just I suppose for clarity, I'm by trade of motion graphics, animator, visual effects, that's, that's what I've been doing for 15 years. Nathan is a VR a uh, specialist, technologist, something like that, wasn't it? Can't remember John Pickle. Yeah. Um, but he specializes in Unreal, and also we have a series of headsets like MetaQuest 2s across the university as well, so we have that for deployment. Um, Callum is our learning designer. Um, you do? Yeah, it's our uh, work with, with persons like Cara, staff, students, um, to implement not just this technology, but VR headsets, augmented reality, mixed reality in general, <clears throat> in not only uh, developing their, their hard and soft skills in their particular subject using this technology, but providing them with uh, a method of innovating um, within that teaching and learning context. So we have a lot of students who present in the space who, unlike a traditional classroom, that have, say, for instance, a PowerPoint on one screen, the classroom is still the classroom. They can contextualize um, both uh, what's in front of the entire visual field range um, in the company months with surround sound to make that presentation more engaging um, and really get a point uh, across that narrative. Um, so yeah, that's that's really my job. But uh, alongside the team, I, I create content and. Working with Cara, we we created bespoke uh, teaching and learning content in Welsh, um, and we're we're embarking on uh, some more projects over the summer. But um, yeah, there's there's 
really what it is, isn't yeah. it? Essentially, just to point out as well, this room isn't specific to a particular course or subject area. It's actually free ring to all staff, students and courses across the university. So we've had Cara such as yourself as teaching language, we've had engineering in here, teachers education, um, we've got sports utilising the room, uh, acting, set design, psychology, yeah. uh, professional doctorates doing a number of different things, uh, leisure and tourism, hospitality. So yeah, we've got quite a broad range of people trying to utilise the room for different reasons as well. Another plus is that it's bringing together disciplines perhaps that wouldn't have worked together before. Um, so, for example, the theatre, we, we would not necessarily have worked with them, but we are in discussions. How can we utilise the room together and to share good practice? So that's been great. Are there any other questions for us that Callum hasn't perhaps answered? I think that's all for that one. So will we take Tracy and Oliver next on theirs? And then we've got one for Claire after that. I'll just mention we actually um, our health and social sciences faculty had some funding so we have actually got an immersive space but I think we're in a position at the minute where we don't really have people with the time or the technical skills to actually really fully utilize it so it's really great to see that you guys have got all that together and you're creating all those amazing things so, yeah and talking about ways well, make sorry it, Ellie as, and talking about the way that they're talking about ways to make it easy for staff to use it. Yeah. I was like very intrigued by that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, someone's asked a question about um, how was ours received by academics? What type of feedback did we get? On the day, we, we did have really, really positive feedback. Um, I think, Steve, it was your presentation. We were talking about fun is first. I love that because that's what we were trying to do. And um, th that was the feedback we were getting, you know, that people really enjoy it, which was a great thing. I want to say to you that the tools increased massively immediately afterwards, but um, it's been a bit of a slow burn, um, to be brutally honest. But we, we have seen things um, people have picked up on different tools. So we had an academic who um, has been doing filming um, just of like lab equipment so he realised there were some students who were very nervous perhaps some of those students with additional learning needs of going into a lab seeing a piece of equipment so we've been creating little videos with them um, and using like the um, hotspots and things to add the uh, directions of how to use things so they can do that learning before they come like, into the environment so that's been really positive that was using mainly H5P, which we didn't mention, um, but H5P was one of the tools we were piloting. So that was one of the tools that we used in the escape room. Um, we have had an academic run and escape room as a kind of induction piece uh, into sort of research methods for her students. So that was very interesting. Um, and that was using the cooler software that I mentioned. So they set up um, a room and there was clues hidden around the room um, and that was partly online but students were also running around the building um trying to find clues so that's that's quite a cool one as well i think a um, lot of academics are feeling a bit swamped right now yeah. with a lot of uh stuff with well we've just been taking up and and rolling out properly just an learning analytics and um and they're suffering <laughs> and they're not enjoying a lot of a lot of the other pressures coming down so I think a lot of them are asking the question is how do I find the time to to build an escape room and what we one of the things we were trying to do was say we can help and we want to help but even you know even our staff is quite limited really we're only a, a small team yeah. um so yeah you know, time is an issue definitely but um I think I having revisited this um and listened to these today as well it's really made me again go right we need to we need to do that again in a different way or a different thing but I I feel like we should just yeah push something out again so feel quite inspired to do that after this I hope that answered the question there was another question about um uh whether or not this kind of similar pr approach has been used and you guys you and you and Ben built an escape room to help teach staff in bubs in the business school um with uh sort of onboarding with brightspace wasn't that a sort of similar thing you guys did yes yeah, so that was a session with so in our business school we 
each year we try we have sort of new things that the staff have to take on and we try to make it a bit more interesting one year so we set up it wasn't technically an escape room but um using bright space which is our VLE we we used the big storytelling element of um Jacqueline Hyde Robert you Louis Stevenson wrote that in Bournemouth we tried to kind of really center it in in Bournemouth um, and they had to go through certain elements on bright space so effectively they were utilizing bright space and, and learning it and also um, learning about some of the new things that come in for that academic year that they needed to know about so yeah on a similar vein yeah Thank you. And then we have one from Suzanne for Claire. So Suzanne, do you want to come on and read that out? Yes, sure. Um, so I, I was really interested in, in Claire using um, escape rooms for summative assessment and I was just interested in uh, some of the details around that. So I wondered what percentage of the overall mark this this counted for and I think you said that the students worked in pairs so I'm just wondering why pairs are not individually or bigger groups uh, and then um, trying to respond to your sort of request for, for help I wondered if you could assess the students on um, a reflective piece at the end of, of, of the uh, taking part in the escape room. Um, yeah, you've kind of read my mind there. That's um, definitely something I picked up from earlier on in the day and thinking, oh, I could potentially do that. The um, So before this year, they would get a final mark based on the final exam. So I kind of split it up. So it became two lower stakes assessments. And this was the first one. Um, it, I ran as a pass fail um, this time round and we're getting a lot of kickback for that kind of thing. So the grade from there wasn't necessarily a grade from this that was going into their final grade. That would come from a written piece of work that they're doing right now in relation to the sort of theoretical content. Um, I would just I think it was more of a driver for engagement that this is stuff these students need. It's pre-registration speech therapy students. They need to know this in second year and third year and fourth year. And I'm sure we'd argue that about any course, you know, that they need to know these things, which is why we teach them. Um, but they did, you know, they weren't holding on to this. So I wanted an activity that they felt was a mandatory one, really. You know, so we put the summative assessment to go, you're going to have to do this. Um, and yeah, to get them there, to get them to engage with it. So I made it pass fail. And I think that's where I'm sitting at the moment is thinking, well, actually, you know, some of them do a lot better than others. Maybe I should make it, you know, the work they're putting in, should I give them a grade for it? So I'm definitely going to look into that reflective piece. The pairs thing, I think there was a couple of reasons behind that. And um, because I really wanted them to engage with the information, I wanted them to have that conversation with someone else. I wanted them to use discussion as a learning mechanism. And the feedback from the students was they really appreciated being able to talk it through with someone else. And, um, you know, I'm looking at the names going, is that because you don't know it? <laughs> but I think there was that element of, all oh, right, yes, I'm actually learning. And it was very much of that kind of, yeah, it's getting moving away from the reciting of information, I guess, to answer the questions and actually think about, well, what's helping me learn? And it's my colleagues doing it too. The other was the puzzles themselves. So um, I knew there was going to be some that would be a wee bit more challenging than others. There was one, and this was one that ChatGPT came up with, which even when I went back on it, when I was doing the presentation, I was like, right, wait a minute. So she had to say whether a state it, there was a statement and it would say whether it was true or false. And you had to decide whether that was right, that the statement was true or false. And it was just too many layers of true or false. And actually, again, it really helped having two of them because some people were able to grapple with that sort of the puzzle complexity. Um, so and the technology. So I think there was a few students who were really scared about having to do something online um, and a kind of very loose timed thing. Um, so the pairs were probably practically worked better for working on a PC, so I didn't make it a bigger group. Um, but I mean, you could do it individually, but actually it was a really nice, enjoyable assessment experience, I think, because they were working in pairs that um, they felt a wee bit more relaxed and ideally were kind of learning from talking to each other. So I think that's all your questions. Is it? Thank yeah. you. Yes, no, that, that's Thanks. great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Suzanne.
So Liz and DJ, that's um, one coming in for you. It's, um, well, and everyone. So the students designing the um, escape room parts, can you kind of delve a bit more deeper into that and how it went and the pitfalls and the benefits? Yeah, I see the, uh, I think the question, so um, yeah, in my video I mentioned that I think because Elaine and I learned so much, so I have very basic Gaelic and Elaine has intermediate Gaelic, um, and what we realised is just through the process of, of designing these different kinds of activities, we, our own um, language and grammar skills and knowledge of, of the cultural history and all of that, developed so much you know it it's like a lot of other aspects a lot of other projects that I work on when you're creating things for students to engage in all different kinds of activities VR whatever it might be the same principle immediately started to apply to to the escape room it's like well actually wouldn't it be fantastic if students were creating escape rooms and I think we've seen some examples of that actually being done by, by some of the presenters today. Um, so we haven't actually tried that out yet, but I do think that that could be a really, I think there's loads of different ways we could have a go at that. Because obviously in the in the, the Gallic um, awareness and support aspect, the work that, that DJ does, he has conversation circles and things like that. Um, it's not kind of Gallic medium education in the sort of like, here's a course to learn Gallic. It is more kind of various different kinds of staff engagement activities. So I think, you know, there is potential there to have kind of, it could be, um, you know, you have freshers week. So with students, you could have like a an activity day where each student, students are broken into groups and they could all come up with different puzzles and then put it together into an escape room. You could do it as, uh, as we, I know DJ, you can jump in if you want, DJ. DJ sometimes has guest speakers come and talk about the fascinating kind of like facts and history about uh, Gaelic and some of those days could certainly kind of start with one of those fascinating talks and then lead into another session where they could create their own escape room after maybe having a go at one of ours um, so I think there's loads of potential there we haven't tested it out yet um, as I say I've tested that kind of activity out like sort of where we used to design the content and students have a go and it's always been a really positive move just haven't tried it with escape rooms yet and i just think that would be a, a great next step yeah Liz, uh, i totally agree and i think where language is concerned it's i think a few people have mentioned this already that it has to be fun and i think this would be the fun element for a student going through doing a pdg or doing whatever course um this could be a place where they could go and actually use some of the learning they've had the official learning in a fun way um, and also the fact that at UHI at the moment we're trying to form a Gaelic student society and this would certainly be something that would we, we could introduce and say well as part of the society you would do Gaelic but in a more informal um, fun way and it's really a crossover of traditions when it comes to the escape room because they're learning older words but also some of the new cooler words and it was interesting in the media over the last couple of days where we're starting to lose the old way of um, maybe having a go at somebody by calling them a, a plonker or something um, and they spoke to some of the younger generation who have come up with words that to insult somebody that I've never heard of so again this could be something that could be introduced um, as part of a fun way and keeping both traditions alive the new modern ways and also the old the old ways so yeah opportunities. Yeah, those are really good. And um, Ollie's mentioning that the principles behind that for other digital um, learning things, he's had really good experience. I've had really good experience as well working with um, students. One thing from my work that came out anecdotally from the students around their work was that the staff were really worried that the standard wouldn't be good enough, even though it was all being peer reviewed and it all got signed off. But actually, the feedback from the students were that the students put more faith 
in the work created by the students because they were nearer to that learning experience by being a year older than what they were writing about. So I thought that was a really interesting perspective that where staff thought it was going to be an inferior experience, the students thought it was a, a better, a far better one. So that, yeah, really interesting. So Liz, we'll keep we'll keep this spot for you then to hear next year how that goes. <laughs> Two minutes left. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to steal the last um, one for Steve, um, because I think your um, audience is a lot like those of us working in staff development. So how do you get that level of fun right where they don't think it's just frivolous? So what's your secret on that one? Yeah, it's mainly in the doing, to be honest. And it's I've, so I, I've worked with different organisations employing this kind of methodology. And um, so ITV is where we started. Uh, that the, the culture there was not just what you need to know and what you need to do, but actually selling it in as being important uh, at that particular point in time. Uh, and actually, they, it just made sense to do something that ITV does, which is make game shows. <laughs> so so it just really fit well there. What I noticed, actually, at other organisations that either have worked out and found out what when they've tried to have escape rooms, so in financial services, that's the most difficult industry, heavily regulated, um, has to be the most secure industry because it's your money and your data and so on. Um, however, there is a culture in, shall we say, sort of, older institutions where the legacy of sort of behavior and culture is a little bit like build it and they will come. So if we throw thousands of tens of thousands of pounds at building an escape room and then pop it up on the intranet, uh, we expect that the floodgates, the, the, the number of times I've heard the phrase, the floodgates will open. No one ever surfed the intranet. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> don't go for a good old browse to read a policy. Doesn't happen. So um, the key thing is to generate as much groundswell as possible by by using employing techniques that make the thing make a lot of noise around the business. You won't get to everybody. This is an escape room in terms of education in the commercial world is one element of a blended mix. You need still need those traditional channels. Unfortunately, you still need mandatory training for auditing purposes and insurance purposes for the company and so on. However, to make noise around the business, give them something fun and and brand it as such as well make it stand out um i in the video that i i made i included one of the trailers we did for toyota which was uh which is a, just a short thing that it was just sort of hollywood kind of you know just throwing it out there it's not corporate looking there's no plinky plonky music and people being interviewed in front of vistas of london because you know a bit of yawn really isn't it but uh, essentially it's something that's going to really you know if people think it's going to be fun and I got a little bit, I don't know, it was the word Steve Jobs about this. When I designed the very first escape room, I took the word security out of it. So not a cyber security escape room, cyber escape room, because I don't want anything with too many syllables in it. Nothing should sound technical because um, it's tradition in lots of companies that technology teams speak to the rest of the business in their own respective language and no one understands what they're saying. So actually, it's making sure you really we, we do a lot of listening in our company. Um, to find out the culture of the business. What are people like? Every every business is subtly different, even if they're in the same industry. And so what's likely to bring them out of their shells? The point about people not having enough time, which I think someone made a little earlier on, is incredibly important because people don't have a lot of time in the commercial world. So you can't do anything that's an hour long. It must be around about 20 minutes, uh, including all the fun elements. Well, excluding the fun elements either side, team photo and prizes and, and all that sort of stuff. But you always leave them wanting more. It's really performance. It's half education, half performance. Um, but I, I really think is absolutely key. What what people have created that I'm looking at right now is, you know, immersive escape rooms and everything. Everything has is absolutely valid and everything is absolutely key. But the, the main thing is that um, uh, you, you really must draw people uh, into it being a fun experience. Actually, the core product is only about 40, 50 percent of the whole thing. How are you going to get people through the door? 
And that's why you have to pull out all the stops and sometimes actually avoiding your own internal communications team, knocking on the door, getting an internet article because that generally doesn't work anyway. Not many people read it. So the best thing to do is to try other other ways. Go a bit guerrilla tactics. Be creative. Be creative. Things shouldn't change when you walk through the glass door of an office or any building at all. We have amazing technological experiences outside of the office. Um, and what I'm looking at on screen on Cara's screen there is you can bring it inside the office as well. And that's so, so key. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's my that's my soapbox moment over with there. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it can be done. Just one final thing I'd say on the escape room. Uh, when we ran the one at ITV, we had a thousand signups voluntarily as a fifth of the of the company in the first month without even playing one game. That was the grounds for we generated by doing things like we took over all the TV screens in the office. Every major corporation has TV screens in it. We just sent them all black, all of them black, same time for about a minute. It only took a minute for people sending emails to to my cyber team. And I'm based in the cyber team uh, saying, I think our TV system's been hacked. And that's when we played the video with the 10 second countdown saying, here's the escape room, the trailer, sign up now. And uh, and that's when the sign ups just went went like a rocket. So it's those sort of things. Just try and think out of the box. Your best friend is your, you know, your technical managers around the building or the media people or whatever. Um, but yeah, have a play. Have fun with the, getting the people through the door as well as the actual core product. I couldn't have asked for a better ending there, Steve. That was <laughs> definitely a perfect last word. So I think there's another question for you in the chat, but I think we will have to bring the live session to a close at this point to give everybody a little break um, before the next one. Round of applause um, plus plus from everyone around the room for our speakers. That was an absolutely fabulous session. And I'm quite sure there will be more questions going on in the chat after this session. So thank you all so much. That was fantastic.